John. All right. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. We've got a good crowd this morning. We're grateful for your presence. I hope we have a good crowd watching us as well. We thank you for choosing to worship with us for, uh, in our live stream this morning. We have visitors. We're glad that you're here. We encourage all our visitors and members to please fill out a card that's in front of the pew, that's in, in back of the pew in front of you. And as you pass out, we have contribution plates for those that want to make your contribution here. Uh, you can make them if you haven't already. For those that are watching or you'd like to make it online, you can do that at our church website. We have a uh, tab there where you can make a, a donation or your contribution, and then you can mail it as well. Um, leading our prayers this morning, Justin Bishop, our opening prayer, and Brent Smith will be leading our closing prayer. We have a few announcements we want to make. First of all, we want to uh, remember Kathy Albright. She is doing better. Had an episode on Thursday with a racing heart and elevated blood pressure, but she's doing better. We're grateful for that. Also, Randy, keep him in her prayers. Randy goes to see his surgeon on Wednesday, and hopefully everything will be good. Kim Kennedy's cousin, Michael Miller, remains in the hospital in Oklahoma City. He's recovering from the COVID-19 virus, and the family wants to thank everyone for their prayers. Mary Beth is here. She and Jeff, she fell at home, and, but she's doing better. We still want to remember Jeff and Mary Beth. Also, Tara Maxwell's father, E.D. Maxwell, uh, they found a, a mass on his bladder. and had to have emergency surgery. They're not sure they got everything, and he may have to undergo some treatment. So we've been asked to remember E.D. Maxwell in our prayers, as well as Mary Lemons Lee, who is related to um, Pam uh, Ortloff and also Lynn Ballou. Continue to remember Maria Sanchez, Keith Vanderbosch, Lena McDaniel, Glenda Henson, Jill Meggie, Kelly Hardman, and Deborah and Billy Moore. Deborah's still in the hospital and we want to keep her in our prayers. Congratulations to Sage Salyer and Miranda Parr on their engagement, upcoming marriage, July 31st, 2021. Sage is the son of Dwayne and Stacy Salyer, and Miranda is the daughter of Rusty and Tanya Parr of Silo, Oklahoma. Next Sunday night, uh, there's two or three things going on. First of all, we'll begin a new class on Sunday night, next Sunday, the first Sunday in February on a New Testament survey. We'll be looking at the, each book, author, the intent, some of the really important passages that are in it, an outline of, of each book. And um, it's a really good study it's, and it's fast paced. We move along one book uh, a, a lesson. Also at 5 p.m., we're going to have a VBS meeting. Uh, we started this last year and had to cancel because of the, the COVID 19, but uh, big plans. You just kind of want to see where everybody's at and go over a date that uh, we have tentatively set for Vacation Bible School, and that will be at 5 p.m. over in the uh, fellowship building. And then Sunday night after services, we'll be handing out the power list. If you have someone that you'd like to put on that power list, then be sure and let me know. You can write it down. Uh, please write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me. We've got the little cards back there that you can write, write it down. Nod from Todd each Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings at 818. And appreciate those that join that or watch it at a later time. Parents, please, we've got back on the back, uh, we've got uh, Bible class material for your children to take home and to work on through the week and then bring it back. And uh, it will be uh, gone over, I don't want to say graded. But it'll be gone over and then returned in the next week's Bible class back. So be sure and do that. Um, 
ladies, we have really a, our secret sister programs for the, our two different groups are going strong, and we're grateful for those that are participating in that. There are some sacks to be picked up in the back, so don't forget. Tonight, we'll be looking at the last chapter of Ecclesiastes and encourage everyone to come for that. And then, as I said, next week's survey of the New Testament, we'll, we'll begin with that. Anything else? Any other announcements I may have forgotten? We had a, a number of people, men and women, that volunteered to help out with uh, the vaccine site. We were asked if the health department could use our facilities uh, for their vaccine site, and our elders graciously uh, said, you bet. And so I appreciate all those that helped out. We had people that were making cookies, bringing food for the workers, people that were working. Uh, and uh, it was just a wonderful blessing to see everyone step up and do that. And uh, we'll be doing this for a few weeks. And if I haven't contacted you about helping and you'd like to help out, uh, let me know and we'll be sure and get you on the list um, uh, in regards to that. Uh, so we want to use everybody that wants to volunteer for that and help out. Okay, good to see everybody. I encourage you to get a song, uh, to join us in our singing. If you're watching online, please join us in our singing. Uh, get your Bible, get some paper, take some notes, and stay engaged in, in our services this morning. But we're glad that you're here. Good crowd. Might be the biggest crowd we've had since we have been back. We'll, we'll know later on. So, but we're glad that you're here. Good morning. Good to see everyone. Sing with me if you would. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Oh, 
righteousness alone. Paul is to stand before the throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You'd all bow with me. Our Father in heaven, our most gracious and most loving God, we come before you on this morning so thankful for this opportunity to gather together, together before you. Father, pray that all that we do this morning will uh, be pleasing in your sight, that you will be glorified through the acts of worship that we do this morning. Father, it is the earnest desire of our heart to please you. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that we receive through um, gatherings such as this, uh, for the love that you have given us, um, the blessings that you continue to to um, abundantly give us, the love that we have um, through our church family, the the relationships that we have, we um, just do not have words for, for how blessed we feel. Father, we pray that you continue to bless the church here at Medill and all of those who um, take part in, 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 in the works that we uh, accomplish through this community. And we pray that through those actions, um, we could be that, that bright and shining light, that hope in this world of darkness that, uh, that others may see uh, and, and come to know you through those actions. We pray, Father, that we would be ready to receive them and, and help them along their way and their journey, that we could be strong Christians and, and loving Christians and, and reach out to those who we know uh, are in need of help. Father, we thank you so much for um, the relationship that we have with you and all that you do for us, that you're with us on a daily basis and that you help us through life. And we know, Father, especially through this last year, that it has been um, some difficult times. Um, but we pray that you would continue to go with us and that you would continue to, to uh, help us to remain steadfast and, and strong in our faith and hope in you. And, Father, um, in those times that we do waver, we pray that you would be there for us and help us to find our way, uh, help us to be repentant um, when we find ourselves in error. Help us to change our ways and, and be strong. And as we do so, Father, uh, we pr pray for your forgiveness, that you would um, help us to always strive uh, for godliness. Father, we um, are just so grateful for all that you do for us, and we continue to pray for all of those who are in need, especially among our church, um, whether it be health problems or financial problems or or just life and stress, whatever it may be, we pray that they would find the comfort and peace that they need and uh, that we could help them along as their brothers and sisters. Um, please be with us for the rest of this morning, this day, Father, and the rest of this week, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We'll sing this next song to begin to prepare our, mind, our minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper. And if you're following along online or if you're following along in your songbook, I like to sing this song a little bit differently. So don't, after the first verse, don't jump into the chorus because what I do, I like to sing all four verses, one right after the other, and then I sing the chorus through once at the end. So I say that so we don't have any other solos. But all four verses and then the chorus one time after the fourth verse. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I was? For crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree. 
Pray with me. Father, as we stand here before you thinking of your son, Jesus, Father, we, uh, as we break this bread that represents Christ's body that was hung on that cruel cross, Father, we ask that we take this in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we continue to commune with you, Father, we are so mindful of the redeeming blood that was shed for each and every one of us worldwide father for we know we are all lost and without hope without the blood of christ father and we are so thankful we can never thank you enough for the tremendous sacrifice of your son we can never thank you enough for for your grace and your mercy and your, your forgiveness through the blood of christ we pray as we partake of this fruit of the vine we are mindful on the significance of what was done for us on calvary it's in christ name we pray amen Stand with me as we sing this song. We'll sing this song before Todd's lesson this morning. 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praise my Savior. Scripture for the lesson today will be 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. It says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Appreciate Scott leading that last song. Actually, all three songs that we sang um, fit the lesson this morning. And Scott does a great job of finding those songs. I know whom I, be I know whom I believed. Just that ability to have that confidence about our future. What's your favorite scripture? I ask that from time to time. You know, sometimes I feel a little silly because I might be teaching a class and it might be in First Thessalonians or it might be in the book of Acts or it might be Philippians and I'm like, yeah, that's my favorite scripture. And it just kind of depends on what the day is. And that's okay. We should have a lot of favorite scriptures. There are a lot to choose from depending on, and very fitting, depending on what we might be dealing with that day. For example, the 23rd Psalm is one that many turn to and, and really love. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, that tells us uh, to be mindful of the things that we're thinking of, whatsoever things are true, just. That's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure. As a matter of fact, on my card and the little cards sometimes that I send out, I've got that passage. Let your mind think on or dwell on these things. I, I love that. Might be John three sixteen. That's uh, probably the most popular, the most well known passage of scripture for God to love the world. One that I like oftentimes is John fourteen, 
1 through 4, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You know that scripture. It's a great scripture. And it'd be fun if we had the time to share our favorite scriptures. And it changes, I'm sure. But the one that we read this morning for our scripture reading is a favorite of many, including mine. And you think about the, the context of what's going on when Paul writes this. These are his last words, the last letter that Paul wrote, his second Timothy. And now we're in the last chapter of the last letter that Paul wrote. Not only that, but the last half, really, of, of the letter, of the last chapter of the last letter that Paul wrote. He's in prison. The second time, the first time he went to Rome and he was under house arrest and he was able to move around a little bit and entertain guests that he had a a Roman soldier chained to him 24 seven that Paul said, you know, it's a good thing because he can't get away from me. But now he's back this second time and it's not as accommodating as the first time. Now he's in prison, prison, perhaps in a dark and damp dungeon or cellar where he's not allowed to get out and roam around maybe he's not even allowed to see sunlight I I don't know but the, the Romans were not known for being very accommodating to their prisoners so he's in prison he knows that he's about to be killed he knows I'm not getting out of this one he says uh, that uh, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. You know, drink offering is something that you offer up to God, and when you pour it out, it's gone. You can't reclaim it. And he says, I'm being poured out, and it's not coming back. It's going to be my end. And you can imagine, perhaps you've been there when you've been quarantined, or you've been in a hospital, or you've had other things where you're off by yourself, and you begin to contemplate about life. And you begin perhaps to contemplate about death. And I believe it's a good thing that we do that from time to time. And I have no doubt that's what Paul is doing, especially as we read these verses 6, 7, and 8, that he's thinking about what's going on and what's going to happen to him. And so he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. That word departure is the picture, the word picture of a a ship that is untying from the dock and setting sail to the other side. Paul says, as I look at my life, I realize that I am untying from this life and I'm about to set sail to the other side. The time of my departure has come. He says, I have fought a good fight. I've finished the course and I've kept the faith. We're going to look at those things and I think be encouraged by these words. I hope that you'll be encouraged by them because Paul is speaking of that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine, a foretaste of glory divine. He talks about that, that we too hopefully are living lives, that we have that blessed assurance. The first thing that he does as he is sitting in jail, maybe laying down or pacing, I don't know, but he takes this downward look. He looks down at himself, he looks down at the earth, he looks down at his situation, and he knows that death was certain, already being poured out. Time of my departure is at hand. I mean, you think about it, we all could say that, could we not? Boy, we've come to realize that perhaps more than ever these past few months as we've seen people struggle with their health and go through difficult situations and circumstances. And we've, we have buried loved ones. We've buried friends and family. We've seen neighbors that have died. We see people that are asking for prayers and then uh, realize that life is short. And in a sense, we're all being poured out. The Hebrew writer says it's appointed for man once to die. And after this, the judgment. So all of us are facing that. There are other passages as well. No one can avoid the fact that we are being poured out. No one can avoid the fact that we are all facing death. Whereas Paul knew that things weren't good and probably in a matter of days, 
he was going to be executed. We don't know the time, but we know there will be a time. The time for my departure has come. Have you ever thought about that? What your life will be and what perhaps people might say about your life and all the things that you have accomplished and maybe the things that you wish you hadn't accomplished. Have you ever thought about what it's going to be like to stand before God? It's a good thing to do from time to time. First Samuel 20 verse 3 says, As the Lord lives and your soul lives, there is hardly a step between me and death. When you think about it. It was just yesterday I saw a picture. My girls, my twins, turn 33 years old tomorrow. Now, it was just yesterday when they were six years old and starting school. Or it seems that. Just a step. Just a step. Life goes so quickly. James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend there and engage in business and make profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Job would say that man is short-lived and full of turmoil. We understand that. We need to remember. Remind ourselves of that. And I think Paul is looking back. Maybe he's recounting his life. And maybe he's thinking about his conversion on the road to Damascus, confronted by Christ, and then his obedience to the words of Christ in the city of Damascus. Maybe he's thinking about the missionary journeys that he took, the people that he encountered, the good things, the bad things, and and everything in between. But he says, I'm being poured out. The time of my departure has come. And when he looks at those things and he realizes that death is near, I don't think he has any fear whatsoever. I want you to ask yourselves, if I knew that death was near, would I be afraid of facing death and why? Maybe you ought to ask why not. But Paul, we look at the writings of Paul. He tells us, for those that are faithful to him, that death will not separate us from God. Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even death separates us. So I don't think he feared it. I don't read fear in this last letter, in this last chapter of the last letter, in the last few hours and days of the life of Paul. I don't see any fear. As a matter of fact, earlier he would write in his first imprisonment in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, he would say, for me to live is Christ, but to die. Now that's gain. He goes on to say, it will mean fruitful labor for me if I'm to live on in the flesh, and I do not know which to choose, but if I am hard-pressed from both directions, if I have said, look, you have to make a choice about living or dying, hard-pressed from both directions, and they're not giving me you know, both choices. I have to choose one. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. I love that. Very much better. It's gain. He looks at that and says, it's a good thing. As a matter of fact, he would say, as he writes to the Christians in Thessalonica, that it doesn't mean loss. It doesn't mean, you know, failure. It means victory. It means success. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, so that you will not grieve as to the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him 
those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So he looks back, or he looks down at himself and what he's facing and what he's done, and he has no fear whatsoever. The second thing that Paul does is he looks back at his life. I have no doubt that Paul had regrets in his life, especially the regrets that he, the life that he lived prior to coming to know Christ and being obedient to him. I think that's one of the things that motivated him and spurred him on to do all the things that he did. But he would say, forgetting what lies behind and looking forward to what lies that I press on. But here, as is often the case, as you get older, you begin to look back. And he says, I have fought a good fight. What's he talking about? What fight is he talking about? Well, I don't think we have to think too much about it. We all understand the fight that goes on. First of all, the fight that we have with our flesh. You know, every day we have a fight with ourselves, don't we? Knowing the right thing to do and not doing it, or knowing the, the, the right thing not to do, but go ahead and doing it. We struggle, and it is a fight emotionally and spiritually. Paul would say in Romans seven twenty three and 24, I... I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? I think every day, just like you and I, every day we fight against temptation, we fight against the flesh, the desires of the flesh, what we want to do as opposed to what we ought to do. We fight almost every day, if not every day, against the world. Against what the world says is acceptable and right. We fight against that. Paul would say in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Now you think about sacrifices. They had to be pure and spotless, without blemish. He's saying, make sure that what you present to God is pure and spotless without blemish, our bodies, which when we walk in the light, we find that cleansing and our robes are washed white. But he goes on to say, that which is your spiritual service of worship, do not be conformed by the world or to this world. Don't let the world tell you how to live. Don't let the world tell you what's right and what's okay. And it's a fight, isn't it? We have friends saying, oh, what's the big deal? Or why is this going on? Or why don't you do this? It's a fight. We see things on TV, now on Facebook, and we hear things all around us to change, to change our commitments. It's a fight. We fight that. And we fight, of course, against Satan. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, we're to put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, take out the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Paul fought against Satan every day. We fight against Satan every day. And it's the good fight. 
And I hope that we can say, I have fought that good fight. He looks back as a runner. I have finished the course. The race that was marked for him. Each one of us, we have a course, we have a race. And it's not about finishing first, it's just about enduring and finishing the race. The Hebrew writer would tell us to run the race and remove all things that might hinder and encumber us from finishing the race. We need to make sure that we're getting rid of those things that slow us down. Sometimes it's attitudes. Sometimes it's priorities. Sometimes it's friends that slow us down. We have to think about who we choose to be in our lives. And we keep our eyes on the prize, on the goal that is ahead of us, not looking back. Because when we look back, that's when we stumble. That's when we get discouraged. That's when we fall. He looks back as a steward, one that was given something by the owner and says, you take care of this. He was given the gospel. It's a treasure that was given him. And he says, I've kept the faith. He's not talking about his faith. He's talking about the faith that we're to keep once for all. It was from from God. Galatians 1, he says, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. This faith that he has, this faith that we have, that we've been given to be stewards of, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To understand that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the true gospel. Paul would say, verses 6 through 9, of those in Galatia, the regions of Galatia, I'm, I'm amazed, I can't believe that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort twist change the gospel of christ but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to that which you have uh, heard contrary to what we preach to you he's to be accursed and he repeats that again he said it's a holy sacred thing and i've kept the faith. He gave himself totally to that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he takes a forward look. He takes a forward look as to what lies ahead. In verse 8, in the future, now, for him, that was probably just a few days away, and he, he had to have known that. But he says, in the future, there will be this day of reckoning. Day of reckoning. That's what it will be. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for your deeds in the body. According to what he has done, whether good or evil, there's going to be this day of reckoning. Romans 14, 11 and 12, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. We should think about that. Sobering? Perhaps exciting, I hope. But he was sure of his reward. In the future, there might be, I hope, no, he says, there 
is the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And that's for all of us who are faithful. As a matter of fact, that's what he says. We sang this song, Blessed Assurance. And it's blessed and it's something that is sure. If we're faithful, we don't have to wonder. That's what Paul is saying. Even for us, he says, not only to me, but to all those who will have loved his appearing, who have looked forward to with great anticipation and joy. Because we know that we've been faithful. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 8 says that he who plants and who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. We're going to be rewarded according to what we've done and what we're doing. First John 3, 1 through 3, John says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It's not appeared as yet what we will be, but we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. That word hope, is not hope so. It is this blessed assurance. Paul had no fear. I have been in homes and I have been in hospital rooms and I have conversed with those who were afraid. Because they had not fought the good fight. They had not finished the course. They had not kept the faith. But it wasn't too late. One of the thrills of being a minister is praying with someone who desires to make things right. And God says, yes. I have been in hospital rooms and I've been in homes when death was certain and the person was ready. Not only ready, but excited. I'm ready to leave this land of dying to go to the land of living. They had no fear. I want to ask you this morning, how do you face death? Do you know that it's gain? Are you ready for that day? Have you kept the faith? Have you finished the course? Have you fought the good fight? Do you have that blessed assurance that comes of being a child of God, a faithful child of God? The Bible teaches us faithfulness is not just something mentally, but it's something we do. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus, the men were lowering down the paralytic, and he says, I see your faith. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, confess His name before men, and be baptized for the remission of sins? And if so, if you've done those things, have you been faithful? If we can help you in any way, I encourage you, if you would, come now as we stand and as we sing. Linger, charm by the world delight.
this next song. If you would like to, feel free to dismiss yourself before the, the crowds disperse. And after we sing two verses of this song, we'll dismiss our service this morning with a prayer. <clears throat> what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning. Scott, Blessed Assurance is one of my favorites, too, and I smile every time we sing it. My Uncle Jimmy led the singing for about 40 years at Western Hills in Fort Worth, and there was a little boy about Justin's boy's size right here, and Uncle Jimmy was leading Blessed Assurance, and he tugged on his mom, and he said, I know why Brother Garner is singing that song. And she said, why is that? And he said, she, he, said he sells insurance. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I smile every time we sing that song, no doubt about it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this day and all the blessings of it. And Father, we can't even comprehend the love and the forgiveness and the grace that you extend to us. But Father, we thank you for it. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, whom without Jesus none of this would be possible. And we thank you for that most wonderful blessing. Father, all of us, we know someone who's been sick or perhaps we've been sick ourselves. And Father, we are mindful of our health and we pray that you will continue to bless us with our health. And those folks that are struggling right now, Father, I pray for strength for them. And strength, Father, for the people who are helping to take care of them, whether it be health care workers in the hospital or maybe family members at home. We pray strength for them as well. Father, we thank you for blessing our congregation, and we pray you'll continue to do so. And Father, we thank you for opportunities that you have brought to us to open up our doors and be a service to the folks that uh, are in need here in our county. And we thank you for that opportunity, and we pray that you'll bless us in that. Father, all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.